Welcome to the Daily Open Chocolate Chat here on Clubhouse. My name is Clay Gordon. I am the creator and the moderator of thechocolatelife.com. Those of you who know, you can go to thechocolatelife.com. You can click on a story, which is called The Chocolate Life on Clubhouse, where you can get a list of this week's sessions, next week's sessions, and an archive to all of the programs that we've done here as part of the Daily Open Chocolate Chat. Uh, we uh, started for a few minutes before we opened up about the little bit of kerfuffle, or as David, thank you very much for joining me again, David, um, called a kerwuffle in his um, inimitable Brit style. Uh, I had posted a link to this uh, room, uh, or a promotion of this room on Instagram and LinkedIn on Twitter, where I included a picture of a dog. And I got some pushback from some people who said, well, you know, chocolate is toxic or chocolate is extremely poisonous uh, to dogs. And so I spent the morning writing a response about chocolate and dogs. And if you go to The Chocolate Life right now, that link is the, the, the primary story on the home page. But all of that, by way, is saying we're going to be talking about tasting, rating, and reviewing chocolate with the idea that how you approach the tasting process is going to have an influence on how you rate and review chocolate. And I've invited David here because he is a judge at the International Chocolate Awards, the Academy of Chocolate Awards, as well as the Good Taste Awards. And um, I have been an international chocolate judge as well as have created the guidelines for what is good for the chocolate and confectionery categories at the Good Food Awards here in the United States. Uh, and this was one of the fundamental challenges that I had back uh, when I was starting out learning to become a chocolate critic. So uh, I had this idea back in 1994 that there were no professional critics for chocolate, and so I saw a market opportunity. I want to become the world's first professional chocolate critic. And I spent seven years uh, trying to figure out what that meant. And part of it was if I wanted to learn how to taste chocolate, uh, for critically, there was no place I could go to learn that. If I wanted to become a wine critic, or if I wanted to become any, there was a place I could go, a school that I could go to, to learn to become a critic or a sommelier in wine. Um, and I could go to journalism school and understand about restaurant criticism. I could go to a design school and learn about architectural criticism. But there was no place that I could go to learn about chocolate criticism, and I had to make it up myself. And so... Um, one of the things that I did is I created a couple of tasting exercises that I use. And the tasting exercises are based on a concept um, which came to me because of my fine arts background. And they're based in the idea of simultaneous contrast, which is a feature of some of Joseph Albers' most famous work, notably his series, The Homage to the Square. And what Albers says is that if you have... Um, two colors which are adjacent to each other, if you change one of those colors, your perception of both of those colors will change. And when you think about it, the human nervous system, that's the way it's built. We're built to say, this thing is closer than that one. This thing is moving faster than that thing is. This blue is more blue than that blue is. The human nervous system is built around making comparisons. And so I started, I developed a technique where what I could do is I could compare two chocolates, sort of describe them, but describe them in terms of this chocolate is sweeter than that chocolate, this chocolate is more bitter than this chocolate, this chocolate is fruitier than this chocolate. And then I would say, of these two, which do I prefer? And then I would take two more chocolates, do the same from an aroma and a taste perspective, select a favorite, and now I have a, a new row in a pyramid, and I have these two chocolates, and I would compare them and select a favorite. And then what I would do, noting what it is that Albert said, is I would rearrange the chocolates at the bottom of the pyramid so that um, instead of tasting chocolate A and B together, I was tasting chocolate A and C and B and D. And because I was tasting these in different orders and in different combinations, my perceptions of the flavors would change. And often where I chose a f one chocolate as a favorite in one comparison, I might not choose it as the favorite in another comparison. And what that meant for me is that my initial focus was on finding how do I find out what I like and why I like it. 
Because if you take notes about this process, what you can do is you can say, well, I tend to prefer chocolates that are fruitier, or I tend to prefer chocolates that right, or sweeter. I tend to prefer chocolates that have, you know, no vanilla in them, right? And ultimately, I think that the point of criticism is not for me to tell you that this is good and that is bad, and because I'm the expert, you should believe me, right? You should pay attention to what it is that I'm doing. I believe my goal as a critic is to help people understand what they like and why they like it. And this comparative approach is very, very different from a descriptive approach, which is the way most criticism is organized. So a descriptive approach is put something in your mouth and try to describe what it is that you're tasting. Right? And what you do when you become a descriptive taster right, is you're learning to, you're, 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 you're training your taste memory. Right? So you put something in your mouth and then you might have some other sort of reference, an aroma, an, an essential oil that you might smell, or some other flavor guide. And what you can do is you can go, oh, this aroma is orange and this flavor is orange. And your taste, you're training your taste memory so that if you put a piece of anything in your mouth, chocolate, wine, whatever it is, you can go, oh, this is orange. I know what oranges are like, right? So if you've never tasted something, you don't have a flavor reference for it, you can't identify it. So you don't necessarily need to be a super taster uh, to become a good descriptive taster. What you need to do is have an extremely good memory, right? And which is something that you can train and you need to have a, a, a wide ranging interest in tasting everything. With the comparative approach, the goal, the goal is to help you understand why you like what you like. So what is it about what you're eating that you like? And then from there, you can go into the, oh, this is a fruit I can identify from the more general to the more specific. Is it a red fruit? Is it a tropical fruit? Is it a dried fruit? Right? And you can, through uh, repetition and more importantly, doing this in a group setting, right? um, be able to get to the point where you can go, oh yeah, now I recognize that this is a red fruit and it's raspberries as opposed to strawberries. But you don't start off saying this is dried strawberries in the chocolate. So that represents my approach to tasting. And I have a number of different tasting exercises. Um, in that, uh, in that genre. So David, I'm going to stop here and say, when you were in culinary school, did a, was there any formal education in tasting and how to taste? Uh, yes, but more with taste and color. Uh, and it was a very brief two afternoon sessions. So nowhere near enough importance to, because of what we were going on to do. Uh, and we did, we made a whole meal, a whole menu where we coloured things wrong. So we made the mashed potatoes blue and the meat was green uh, to play tricks on the brain and then see if we could get people to eat the food that we'd made. And they were interesting exercises. And then we played with the colours of plates that we served food on that made people eat things uh, faster, slower. Uh, or eat more of things. That's really interesting. But you're you're in a two year culinary program. Uh, three three years. So you're in a three year culinary program, and out of three years, you spent part of two days thinking about tasting and more on how does color affect the perception of taste than it, it actually about, yeah, how to taste. Yeah, eating right. with our eyes. Uh, since since then. I've obviously developed several exercises. And one of the things that I found really helpful when I moved into chocolate is I met you towards the beginning of my chocolate journey. Uh, and I'd been used to people uh, being super tasters and telling me exactly what they could find, like a wine taster would do. Uh, and again, part of my college training was to do alcoholic beverages, and I'm a qualified sommelier. However... Uh, I wasn't practicing that skill every day, so that muscle wasn't being flexed and exercised and improved. Uh, but you'd said, you know, it's fine to not know. And you can suggest that if somebody uh, says, oh, yeah, I recognize that, because lots of the functions and judgings that I do 
mm-hmm. are done in isolation. You might do them in a group, but you're encouraged to be quiet and not talk to the other members until you finish the tasting. Then you're not influenced by someone else. Mm-hmm. I find the influence very helpful. Don't always agree, but that's fine right. because our palates are individual. Right. Right. No, you know, I think that's a really, really important uh, point to understand, and it's one that I brought up uh, in previous rooms uh, in this club and other places. Is it, and it's something that I emphasize in every single one of my tasting um, classes that I give. Is that every single one of us has our own sense of taste. Every single one of us has our own sense of smell, and every one of us grows up in a different food culture. So somebody who grows up in Japan has a particular uh, preference to flavors and aversion to other flavors. If I grow up in India, I have a, a, a certain preference for these flavors where I might have um, uh, never, been, never been exposed to some other flavors. And so those are going to have a really strong influence on how we perceive the flavors and what it is that we're eating. So for example, in, you know, in India, the notion of putting curry in a chocolate would not seem outrageous because we know the range of flavors which are associated with curry and we can imagine curry and chocolate going together. Where if somebody, um, for example, in the Southern United States or you know, uh, had, never been, had never been exposed to curry, you know, and they, they might think that it was a crazy thing to do. So the way we are taught to taste the cultural um, milieu in which we grow up are going to affect how we think about rating and reviewing chocolate. So this was one of my first, one of my last concerns as I was thinking about making the move from doing my research to publishing online. How am I going to go become a chocolate critic um, out there in the real world? And I knew that I needed a rating system. And I had a particular antipathy to rating systems that ended up with a number. So this chocolate is a 8.2. Number one is I wanted uh, a rating system that did not require a calculator, right? So that people could understand how I arrived at the rating, but they wouldn't need to be, they wouldn't need to actually have um, a series of individual ratings. So for example, there's a rating for how the chocolate looks. There's a rating for um, how the chocolate smells. There's a rating for how the chocolate tastes. There's a rating for texture. And what you have to do is you have to say some of these uh, parameters are more important, so they have greater weight than others. And so we might give taste a weight of 50%, whereas aroma is a weight of 10%. And if you rate each one of these on a scale of 0 to 9 or 1 to 10, or 1 to one, 0 to 10, what you have to do is you now have to calculate the relative weight of these factors and add them up until you get into a single number. And that seemed to me like just too intellectual, too analytical, right? And sort of, uh, so I wanted something that did not require a calculator in order to be able to come up with a rating. And so my first rating system focused on the notion of value, right? Rather than trying to come up with a, a single number. And the reason why I focused on value is because I thought at the time that this was a way that a lot of people thought about their chocolate. So I divided chocolate up to, into a number of categories. I had a Northern European style of chocolate making, which I thought of as lighter and sweeter, a Southern European style of chocolate making, which was darker and more intense. Uh, you might think of it as the difference between a cappuccino and an espresso. Right? And then we had um, the American style of chocolate making for which there was no subtlety whatsoever. If something said it was orange, you know, it just beat you over the head with um, its orangeness. You know, the Belgian tended to be lighter and sweeter, or the Northern European was lighter and sweeter, and in uh, pralines, uh, it was really a focus on the flavor of the fillings, not the flavor of the chocolate. You know, with French chocolate, it was darker and richer, but when you think about a ganache from somebody like La Maison de Chocolat, you know, Robert Lynx, um, sometimes you'd go, what was the flavor I was tasting? It was so subtle, it was really more about the chocolate than it was about. So there were some broad styles of chocolate making. And then at the time I started this in the early 2000s, there was an emergence of a style um, which combined the American style with the Southern, with the European style. So it was 
chocolate forward, but all of the flavors in the fillings were readily identifiable and it tended to be a little less sweet. So I had these styles of chocolate making and what I could do is I could say, here is a chocolate and I'm going to apply it to this style. And so people could say, you know, I generally like chocolates which are lighter and sweeter in which the flavors are really, the flavor is really about the filling and not the chocolate. And it, it made it easy to identify where your flavor preferences were. I then um, divided the, the market for chocolate based upon what I had learned from market research about um, cost. So there was uh, market research that says mass market chocolate is anything that costs $15 a pound or less. Uh, gourmet chocolate is anything that costs more than $15 a pound. And what I did is I subdivided that just a little bit more. So I said there's a, a mass market, the mass market premium is $15 to $25 a pound. There's a $25 to $35 a pound range. And then there's anything over $35 a pound. And I could now say, okay, so this is a European style chocolate uh, in the mass market premium price range. Right. And so we could identify where something sat. And from there, I said, I am going to do my value calculation. So a four is eh. Uh, a seven is this is a superior example of this style of chocolate in this price range, right? And then a zero is, you know, not worth the calories, you know, don't, don't, don't buy it at all, right? And so what you got in that rating system is my notion of the overall quality and value of the chocolate before I got into the descriptive of here is a piece that I tasted and here's what I tasted in that piece. And so I presented it in a very, very different kind of context. I didn't need a calculator. It was just, you know, my thoughts and my impressions. And one of the reasons, another reason why I don't like calculators is there's a psychological component that I don't think many people pay attention to, which is that the difference between an 8.7 or an 87 and 89 is two points, right? The difference between 80, 90, 89 and 91 is two points, but psychologically, numbers beginning with the number nine, right, have a lot more psychological weight than numbers which begin with eight. And so once you cross a threshold from 70 to 80 or 80 to 90, there's something magical that happens with that number, which is... You know, in real, in real terms, we're only talking about two, two point differential. And what does that really mean? Because it all depends upon the weighting of the individual components that I'm putting together. So that's how I think about rating and reviewing chocolate. I, I think about value. I think about comparison. And it is that experience in developing a comparative rating system, which moved into my creating this system based on value, not on using a calculator. And at this point, if anybody has any questions, any comments they'd like to make, raise your hand and move, uh, let me know where things go. Uh, and we'll be happy to move you up to the stage uh, so you can ask questions. And at this point, I'll also say we're about 20 minutes through um, today's daily open chocolate chat here on Clubhouse, where the topic is tasting, rating, and reviewing chocolate. Now, David, right, while we wait for people in the audience to think about this, um, you are a chocolate judge, and you're a judge at th at least three different competitions you shared with me. So can you tell me something about the differences between the approaches that each of these um, different competitions have and which you personally um, like the most and which you personally think um, gives the most value to what it is that consumers might want about the products that you're rating and reviewing? I can't. The, uh, I've got Great Taste Awards, which is probably the one, the method I prefer, where you would sit at a table with uh, either a food critic or a food journalist or an industry expert, and then you would sit with five or six other people who were all loosely from the industry from various levels. So from the Women's Institute uh, Cookery School 
right through to chefs or manufacturers of different sectors. Then you would sit down with products, have a, the head of the table would have notes on the computer and would read the manufacturer or maker's description of the product. But so that was their paragraph and what they wanted you to know. Uh, and then you would all taste it and go through a very basic, did I like it? What did it taste like? If I did like it, what did I like about that? Like a consumer would. And I thought that had great value. And the experts around the table would then say, well, that might taste like that because of this. And it worked. sometimes it was a defect and sometimes it was a, a, a touch of genius that had brought a, another level that we didn't expect. And the other people would say, oh, yeah, so, yeah I, I understand that. So I think that was very helpful. Mm. The other methods, uh, which are specific, I've judged in the Great Steak Awards, uh, which or the World Steak Awards, sorry, which are a similar process to that, that you have a table expert and then you would uh, do I like it, yes or no, uh, and why do I like it, yes or no, and and does it do what it says on the tin is the other basic description matching the uh, your expectation. But the other two, uh, to lesser and greater degrees, you have a form that has a, a list of terminology uh, that would go through uh, appearance and it would say shine, uh, errors, defects, whether, and there'll be a, a list of examples of what those defects may be. And with the appearance, it could be bloomed, it could be shell leaking, it could be damage. Uh, and you'd go through those things. So very technical, mm -hmm. but most of the judges judging are technical judges also. But I don't know how much of that is useful to the consumer because every batch is handmade often and every batch is uh, bean to bar one production that's going to change next time, probably. Uh, and once you get to bigger manufacturers, then that slightly changes. And then the third method is one where you're encouraged not to talk at all uh, mm -hmm. as you go through the process and you go down a sheet and you answer the questions uh, in the sheet, and there's, uh, as you click through on the computer, because it's all electronic, it brings up a flavour map, and then you can highlight the flavours there. When you get to the end of that tasting, you can review that flavour map, and it will show hot spots and cold spots in particular flavour areas, mm -hmm. and you would then say, yes, that, that's how it left me feeling. But that's quite technical, and I'm not sure if a consumer would spend enough time contemplating those things to get the same results I got, because I know what I'm expected to do, and therefore I'm tasting in a different way, if that makes sense. Right, and unfortunately in that particular case, those hotspot color maps, which you're talking about r r related to taste, are actually not published to the public. So, you know, they are private as a part of some research program. Uh, I don't know how they will be uh, intended intended to be used going forward. At least... You know. I, I've sent you a copy of what they look like, uh, mm -hmm. and that's available as a free download. So I've not uh, broken any confidences, but I've sent you a copy so it right. can go on the drive. Great. So thank you. I will, I will do that. And that is something relatively new. Um, I've been asking um, to see some of these things for some time, and I'm glad that they are finally being shared. And, you know, I, I, I am always open to being corrected if any bit of information that I present is in any way wrong or misleading. I, would, I want to believe as many true things as possible and as few wrong things as possible. So please do not hesitate um, to to uh, suggest where you think I may be incorrect, um, and I am more than happy to go do the research. And if I, if it turns out that I have been in fact misinformed and am spreading the wrong information, I will happily not only retract my position, but also credit the person who pointed me uh, in the direction of the research. So thank you, David. Um, I've been seeing all these things coming across, and for for everybody who may not know, I do keep a. Uh, a shared folder on a Google Drive 
for these clubhouse rooms. They're organized by week. Um, each week has a document which lists all of the session, all of the rooms, the topics, and if there are links which are mentioned, um, I put if there are, if there are resources that are mentioned, I put the links in the Google Drive, and if there are documents that are mentioned, I put them loose in the folder. So you have the opportunity to go and look at those um, as well. So I'm inviting Keith up to the stage. Uh, so Keith, when you get up, good morning. Uh, yes, morning? good. I'm I'm doing fine. Thanks very much. It was um, this is my first uh, session to join, so thank you very much. And um, it's a fascinating one. Uh, one of the things I, I wanted to ask uh, David, as, as a chocolate critic, um, and I, I guess anybody, um, I noticed that my tastes in chocolate have evolved over many years. Have yours as a critic, and does that influence how you perceive what you're tasting, or is it do you try to be as objective as possible? Because people do have preferences, and, and um, there, there are times when I've um, tasted chocolate and I've looked at the maker's notes, and sometimes they're spot on, and sometimes I just – I'll get two of the three notes that they're talking about, and I thought, well, you know what? I don't get the raspberry. Sorry, it's not coming through, whatever. Um, but also, just from a preference standpoint, um, sometimes what I like has changed over the years. Does that impact? Is it the same for a critic as well? Absolutely. Uh, but I think uh, the, the difference is we'll try to refresh our palates. And one of the things that is done uh, with one of the competitions, which I find particularly helpful, is we'll start with a calibration or three calibration chocolates. And these are chocolates that we all know what we should taste. We all know who they're made by. So we've we've got many known points we'll taste that judge it and and hopefully agree with what we're tasting or not and if everybody disagrees with what we're tasting then you know there's something wrong with that batch so you can all agree that it's changed and then after 20 samples you refresh your palate and sometimes it will be with cold unseasoned polenta or a piece of dry bread to try and remove the chocolate coating from your mouth so you can start again. Uh, but some of the fashions and trends that come through with chocolate uh, do influence. But, you know, if I see another salted caramel, uh, again, it'll be too soon, really, uh, because you know everyone has a version of salted caramel. And now we're seeing X interesting i was gonna say exciting sometimes they're exciting sometimes they're really interesting flavors coming through mm -hmm. uh one of the ones recently was a, a candy cap mushroom flavor that came in uh i won't say how that was because it's got to be announced and other people are judging but you will find interesting things and hopefully uh it's the base chocolate that I'm tasting and the flavor pairings rather than being uh, developed because what I would choose to eat tomorrow might be a snicker bar because I just need a, a, a sugar hit and I'm going to do something. Whereas tomorrow evening I might be sitting down to watch a movie and would want something with a glass of port that's, that's different. So there are different occasions and I'm able to uh, separate them out. So Keith, I'm going to jump in here as well and say that um, of the judge, of the awards programs that I have been a judge in, the International Chocolate Awards is the only one that I have participated in where they use these reference calibration chocolates. Before you start off, you are asked to take taste this particular chocolate, often Valrhona Manjari because it is everybody knows what that is supposed to taste like, and you write down your impressions of this chocolate before you begin. Then you run through and do another of samples. It could be a couple of flights of eight or nine or 10 chocolates. Um, and then you go back and you review the Manjari and what you, or whatever the reference chocolate is. And what you do is you say, does the chocolate taste different now than it did when I started out? Right? And so you can see if your palate is become fatigue or if your perceptions are drifting in one direction or another. And I think that's a really, really um, valuable tool um, if what you're going to be doing is you're going to be faced with rating a lot of chocolates descriptively, 
So you need to say, here is the visual appearance. I give it a rating of this on a scale of 1 to 5. And this is the aroma, and I give it a rating on a scale of 1 to 5. And here's the taste I give, and texture, and I give it a rating on scale of 1 to 5. And then you're sort of given a, you know, do I like it or not, um, which also figures into the, um, into, the, um, into the equation. I also want to say that you know, I've run into um, the experience that David has when he talked about salted caramels. I was a judge one year in the confectionery category um, at the Good Food Awards. And we were at the table um, in the afternoon. So all of the chocolates had gone through a round of judging. And we were, those same chocolates went to another table to do a round of judging in the afternoon. And we were faced with you know, like four salted, four salted caramels and five other things during this flight. And one of them, I believe, was a marzipan, which might have been flavored with cayenne, but it was a marzipan, which was unusually flavored. And all of them, by the time they had got to that point, were extremely well made. I mean, no technical faults whatsoever, just, you know, every single one of them was a joy with respect to texture and flavor combinations, a lot of fun. But by that time, over the course of the judging, we'd had 20 salted caramels. Uh, as David said, you know, it's, it is probably the world's favorite flavor when it comes to um, chocolate these days. And we had a discussion around the table. And this is one of the things that I really liked about the way we put together the Good Food Awards judging, is that everybody sitting around the table would individually rate. Then what we would do is do, do a quick calculation of the rating right, um, based on, you know, who, how many people gave it the highest rating, and then how many people gave it the second highest rating. And then we looked at, in this particular case, okay, we have rewarded six or seven salted caramels already. Do we want to do another salted caramel, irrespective of how good it is, or do we want to reward somebody who's doing something interesting and innovative, right, in a flavor way, combined with an ingredient you normally wouldn't associate with that flavoring. And that engendered a really interesting, really lively discussion among the judges. And that's what I love. That's what I value. That's what I cherish. That's the experience that I want to have as a judge, speaking with other professionals and looking not just as, is it well made, you could put it in your mouth and in three seconds say, is it well made? But, you know, is this interesting? Have I tried this before? Um, and I've gotten to the point where I am, I dread having rounds in um, a judging competition where I'm going to have seven, you know, 72, 70% single origin chocolates from the same origin, you know, all made in a wet grinder. I mean, there is a sort of sameness to everything. Um, if they're you know, they're competently made, you know, there's a, a flavor everybody's trying to get with respect to a particular origin and a particular varietal. But when you've got seven of the Moreau trying to be objective, as you pointed out, Keith, trying to be objective and really nitpick really tiny differences is a technical exercise that I think makes a lot of sense um, in... Um, to a small percentage of the community, it makes sense among chocolate makers to go and do that. But to the general public, I am not at all convinced um, that it's meaningful, right? Especially when the difference between a 4.2 and a 4.1 is expressed as the difference between silver and bronze, right? And there are 20 other silvers and 19 other bronzes in the same category, right? It becomes really difficult to understand the value that's associated with that, if that makes sense. It, it does, and, and to you and to David, do you, this is an odd but, but, but realistic question. Do you actually swallow everything, or is there a spittoon like there is for wine tasters and coffee tasters? Because I would think it'd be a little overwhelming after a whole day of chocolate tasting, as much as we all love it. Absolutely. It would be a, a mixture of both. There's always something to, to spit into, usually a, a plastic vending cup. Uh, I think I mentioned a couple of days ago when I worked for a pastry company, we would benchmark 200 different quiches in one day. So you couldn't possibly uh, right. taste. But often at the beginning of a session, you might, or, or, or the ones that are really nice, you might swallow. But I only ever put a quarter 
of the sample into my mouth and then I'll decide whether I'm going to have some more based on, on how good it is or not. So, yes, Keith, there is a process that we go through. And I would say, in my experience, that judges will tend to consume all of what they like and only part of what they don't like. Um, and uh, they will um, use the spit cup uh, if given the opportunity. It's a little different from spirits where the actual alcohol will numb your mouth and you don't want to keep it in your mouth very long. But as you may know from cupping coffee, you actually, I mean, some people, some people, drink the coffee, and some people spit it out. I mean, for me, one of the things, one of the techniques that I have learned over the course of um, doing this is that if there is going to be a, a real defect in a chocolate, it often shows up in the long aftertaste. So if you can have a chocolate in your mouth and let it sit there for a minute or two, and, you know, it's gone all the way down your throat, so it's coated the back of your tongue and the back of your mouth. There, there's a defect. It might be a, le a lingering astringency, for example, um, or often if they're using a sugar alternative. For me, you know, if that if there is a sugar alternative and there's and there's any any mismatch in the recipe, it will show up in the long aftertaste. So I will often completely consume a sample of chocolate that I really like. Right? So something that I haven't rejected, obviously, because it has a defect, and then sit there and try to let that chocolate linger in my mouth for a couple of minutes so that I can get a sense of, you know, just, you know, are there any defects from manufacturing? Are there any defects um, from fermenting and drying? Are there any defects in the recipe which might come from an ingredient? And so that's, you know, something that I uh, uh, apply adaptively during the course of the tasting. I'm more likely to let something sit in my mouth and swallow it for an extended period of time. I'm more likely to let some to swallow something and let it sit in my mouth for an extended period of time if I really like it, because I'm trying to determine if there's anything in there that I might that might cause me to change my opinion. Quite a few of the uh, awards schemes will have a checkbox at the end to remind you of what you've just said in, in your scoring form. So that it's almost like saying, do you realise you've not given that an award or did you realise you've made that goal? And people like Great Taste would allow the tables to go up to two stars, but if you thought something was three star, it then went up to a more senior, a table full of experts to be confirmed that what you all tasted as a table, they agree with, and because they coveted a three-star award so much more than a one or a two. Uh, so the consumer can be very, very sure that a three-star Great Taste Award is a great taste. Yeah, and I think that, I think that what it is that the Great Taste Award values and what it is that is there to promote is different from other awards. I mean, if I can, Zelia, I'm I'm I'm, I'm saying your name um, so that if you know if you're not paying a hundred percent attention because you've got this on in the background and you're doing something else. I mean, you um, created an awards in the Premio uh, Bean de Bar Chocolate in Brazil, and I know that these are issues that you have struggled with as you create the guidelines um, for the judges. So how much of these kinds of things that we've been talking about have been a part of your thinking when you've been thinking about the scoring? Um, Clay, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I have been also a judge in, at International Chocolate Awards, and I'm not a judge in my competition. Uh, I think it's it's difficult. I, I'm changing my mind about um, reviewing chocolates now. Uh, I've heard you before about the um, uh, your comparisons, and I think that's interesting. And it's interesting that um, consumers have a different way of thinking than judges. Where we have uh, quality can be a technical thing and can be a quality related to, to what the person wants and prefers. 
So, uh, I don't know. I'm changing my mind about the way things should be done in competitions, in fact, <laughs> regarding all, all the things you are saying now. Well, I, I think, Keith, this is very, very much to your point. There are two parts about criticism. Number one is, I mean, um, for example, is that um, in the early 1980s in New York City during the summer between years at RISD, um, I was um, in a situation where I had a lot of film fans um, in my circle. And what we would do is we would sometimes go to two or three or four different movies over the course of one weekend. Right? And one of the things that I learned was that if Rex Reed liked a movie, I was likely to hate it. And if Rex Reed hated a movie, I was likely to like it. And so I think that one of the things that happens when you look at critics is you need to understand what the critics' biases are and how often their reviews sort of match your own particular sensibilities. So I could look at a Rex Reed review and irrespective of what anybody else said, have a, have a pretty good sense about whether or not I would like a movie or not, whether I would enjoy it. I mean, it might not, and enjoyment was what I was looking for. I wasn't necessarily going to movie to pick it apart as a film critic would, to say, is the direction any good? Is the lighting any good? Is the dialogue any good? Is the pacing any good? Is the editing any good? You know, just am I going to this movie for a good time? And I think that that's part of the disconnect here about judging, right? Most people, I think, most consumers especially, when they think about chocolate, think about whether or not they're going to enjoy it, whether or not they're going to like it. And they may not necessarily have the expertise and experience to be able to dial in why they like it or why they don't like it or what it is that they don't like about it. And so that is one of the things. As people become more sophisticated consumers... Right? They might begin to understand, oh, this is what astringency is, and I don't like it in this context. But in other places, astringency is really good. Right? Yes, also, sure. teaching consumers to taste uh, using all five senses changes their perception. Because I quite often will do a tasting session with people, and at the end, I will give them a piece of high street confectionery, a piece of Cadbury's or Galaxy or whatever, uh, chocolate, and they will then tell me they don't like it. Whereas at the beginning of the, that would have been the normal mm -hmm. uh, everyday chocolate to eat. But once they've an appreciation, uh, the example is I used to have a product with chili. And if you just put that in your mouth, crunch it and swallow it, all you will get is dark chocolate with a slight hint. But if you actually uh, slow down, and look and smell and, and do those uh, sensory evaluation, then you'll feel the orange release before the chili because the particulate size is different. Mm -hmm. So you get chocolate, orange, then chili in that order. And I could see the look of surprise and disbelief on people's face as they watch that happen uh, in their mouths. You know, you could actually recognize it on their face that they'd learned how to taste. Right. And the way I present that sort of concept is that most people eat chocolate, they don't taste chocolate. And so tasting is actually a deliberate process where what you're doing is you're paying attention to all of the sensory components of what it is that you're eating. And so it's a conscious process as I, opposed to an unconscious one. I'd have to agree. I, I think most people, especially nowadays, tend to eat too fast, whatever it is, and they sort of gulp food, and that includes chocolate, rather than taste it. Tasting means you have to slow it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's hard for a lot of people to get used to doing. But if you taste it, and become more, it basically you're, you're becoming a more mindful taster. And when you do that, your taste buds become less dumbed down, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Um, and you can actually be a little more sensitized to it. But I do think people tend to, if you eat it fast, you're not going to get the full benefit. You just get the fuel, the calories. Right. And it's like, uh, and, and then, uh, but again, that, that's like, to me, don't get really high end chocolate for that, please. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Take a Snickers bar. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, just like the same thing with the, 
like a, a, a very like wonderful bottle of wine or, or champagne or something like that, savor it a little bit. And um, if you're not going to savor the chocolate, don't bother spending a lot. Yeah. So Keith, I actually, I actually um, have a slightly, slightly different way of thinking about it. And unfortunately, in the process of waiting for you to say that, um, it it slipped, uh, it slipped my mind. What I have said in the past is that when I think about um, good chocolate, when I think about the chocolate that I like to eat, um, what I want is I want to put a piece of chocolate in my mouth and I want it to put a smile on my face. Right? And if it can do that, um, it's a quality chocolate, right? And I don't care what it is. I think all of us have what I think of as secret chocolate obsessions. So when I was starting out, I was writing a month or a, a, a newsletter which got put into Chocolatier magazine. And one of the features in that um, newsletter was uh, I would interview pastry chefs about what their secret chocolate obsessions were. So I had a friend of mine who is the executive pastry chef for Danielle Bouloud, a restaurant Danielle here in New York, and he's French. And he says his secret chocolate obsession was Snickers bars. And if you're French and peanuts, I mean, you could have any chocolate in the world, and, but when you're not in the kitchen eating what it is that you make, you know, a Snickers bar is what it is, right? And uh, Pichet Ong, who was at Spice Market, really talented, really, really lovely guy, um, his secret chocolate obsession, he said to me, was Maltesers, right? Which is, you know, you you have, you know, you know you're, you're sitting here in a Jean Georges Von, Ger Von Gerichten restaurant, and Maltesers is what you reach when you just want to enjoy, you know, having some chocolate. And I've learned that we all have that. I mean, my secret chocolate obsession is around Halloween candy. It, you know, it's once a year that I will go in and out of my kids' trick. Now that I don't have kids trick or treating, I I rarely eat these things anymore. Um, is, you know, a good Reese's peanut butter cup, right? Dang. I mean, it takes me back to childhood. A uh, Butterfinger. I mean, these are, these are secret chocolate obsessions. But I divide chocolate eating into eating professionally and eating recreationally. And I think of those two things very, very different. You know, with recreational chocolate, you just want me to sit down. I want to put something in my mouth and I just want to enjoy it. I am dark milk chocolate all the way, right? I, Yes, for example, and you know this is counter to the way many um, craft chocolate enthusiasts think um, and the approach chocolate tasting, which I find very interesting. This is this was making me laugh, frankly, uh, it, Clay, because I I sort of divided it a little differently. I think of it as indulgence chocolate versus what I'd call maintenance chocolate, <laughs> which is what you might get offered on an airplane or something like that. But you know what? It's there. Um, so I, I, I hear you. Okay. I so think it's, I think no, it's fair game. All right. And I, so I think that you just hit on it. Uh, I just think you hit on really, really a key component. And Dina, um, you've been invited up on stage. I'm going to let you uh, go talk. But I, what I want to do is I want to say something is that um, what you like is what you like. And how you think about it is how you think about it. And most importantly, what you don't want to be, what you don't want to let happen is for anybody convince you that you're wrong or bad or somehow deficient for liking what you like and how you think about it. So I think it about it because I'm a professional. I think about it as professional and recreational. You think about it as indulgence or maintenance. I understand immediately what you say, what you mean when you say indulgence um, as opposed to maintenance. And that is the key. You know, you're using, we're both using language that we both can understand and we can connect with. And I think that that is the key. I mean, it is the fundamental key to why some people are really successful as critics and other people's are not. Because what they can do is, is they can use language that people can connect with and understand and put themselves in that position of understanding and go, yeah, I get it. So Dina, welcome to the stage. Welcome to the Daily Open Chocolate Chat here in Clubhouse. What have you got to say? Great. Right. Thank you so much for bringing me up on stage. I've just been really enjoying the conversation. And what you just were saying was spot on. You know, um, 
I purchased this factory, this candy factory. It's a hard candy company. It's almost a hundred years old. And we make candy just with the same recipes, the same methods that were used a hundred years ago. So we have this, we craft this beautiful little gem of a hard candy that is packed full of flavor, not too sweet, not too tart, but I've often wondered, you know, how can I be innovative, innovative with the candy? You know, we're, we're making it the same way so you just get this really rich flavor mm. and it lasts through the whole piece of candy because we literally fold in the flavors and fold in the colors that we use. Colors. Um, but what I tried last year, because I'm a huge chocolate fan, and I was raised in Honduras, and the Honduran chocolate is very, very delicious. And I actually, when we're in the process of making the candy, right before it goes into the uh, extruder, I inserted some chocolate. I did it with white chocolate and with dark, dark chocolate. And when you put that piece of candy, we ate the whole batch, and we ate both batches. Mm. <laughs> when you put that piece of candy with that wonderful flavor and that hardness on the outside, and then you finally get to the chocolate, and it's this end of a wonderful meal. It was just, and I'm just wondering, I would love to do more of that, mm -hmm. and just trying <clears throat> to figure out I, how can I go about doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, I think it takes a special kind of, you know, it, it wasn't really done correctly where I could actually make big batches of this. Mm. But I just love the idea of it. This is Dana, I'm done speaking. Thank you. So um, for everybody, Dina has a business in North Carolina called Butterfield's Candies. And so you can go look at her profile, follow her, and uh, learn more about what uh, she is doing down there. And Lynn, just give me a moment. What I want to say is, um, Dina, uh, I would suggest that one of the things you do is you go look at a Canadian company called Ganong, G-A-N-O-N-G. And they're in the Maritimes. Um, so they're on the East Coast. And one of the products that they make is called chicken bones, and it's vegan. So, you know, no, no, no animals, no birds were harmed in the making of these products. But what a chicken bone is, is it's a tube of cinnamon candy. So it is a cinnamon sugar candy, which is extruded into a tube. And inside that tube is a dark chocolate ganache. Right. So that, I mean, cinnamon and, you know, cinnamon and chocolate, great combination. But what you do is you get the crunch of the tube and then you get the richness of the ganache inside. And so what you might want to think about doing is, number one, go take a look at that product and go, OK, how might I might, how I might manufacture something like that? And then start thinking about how you would go about pairing it. So you're in the South. Um, you've got... Um, Peach, so even though that's a Georgia thing, not a North Carolina thing, but you've got peaches and that goes with chocolate. What kind of chocolate would I want? Uh, you've got, you know, what are, think about desserts that are really, really common in your part of the world. So let's say pecans are another Southern thing. I mean, I think of them more as um, Alabama than I do as North Carolina, but certainly, you know, could I do a nut paste with chocolate that could go inside of something? Does that make kind of sense? So think about flavor combinations which resonate historically in the food culture where you are and think about how you might incorporate them as you've just done, as a filling for a, um, a hard candy shell, a cooked sugar shell. Thank you so much for that, Clay. Actually, our signature flavor is peach. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm just loving that. Thank you so much, Ganon. I'm going to check it out yeah. right now. Thank Ganons. you. Ganon's. I mean, it's it's a really, really fabulous. I mean, there is a book on Ganon's which has been written, which gives the family history, you know, how they got into the business and the vicissitudes and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was lucky enough to have family members who were visiting up in Nova Scotia, and they had actually given me the book on Ganon's. 
uh, when I was just starting off, and they went out of their way to go to Ganong's and pick me up samples of the things that we had read about in the book. Um, and I think that you know the, the, you've 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 hit on something which is really important. So when I was starting out, one of my first consulting clients was um, in Nashville. And one of the things they asked me is like, you know, how do I take, you know, how do I bring New York City to Nashville, right, in terms of what they were doing? And I said, I think you're thinking about it backwards, which is how do I take Nashville to New York City, which is, you know, what is it that is the unique flavors, the things which really resonate in the food culture where you are? Maybe it's the low country, uh, you know, maybe, and I would not shy away from barbecue, right? Because it's a big thing in North Carolina, and you know, there have got to be ways to take those flavors. I mean, are you a vinegar or a mustard-based barbecue kind of person? And I forget in North Carolina which it is. Yeah, it's vinegar-based. Right. Well, there um, there is going to be a way to do that really, really successfully in um, a hard candy context with the shell, with something which is acidic, which reminds you of barbecue. You could even put pork scratchings in the ganache. I mean, I mean, yeah, no, no, no. I, mean, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So, you know, you know, it just, it just, and you know, and that's the fat. I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the fat from the pork scratching right in there. Right. I know this is going to horrify any vegans in the room. Right. Uh, but, you know, it, you know, I think that that is the richest source of inspiration. You have a company that is 100 years old. Listen to that history and listen to the history of the food culture around you. And it's not necessarily not necessarily what most people would think about being innovative. What it is, it's taking common flavors that everybody loves and representing them in a different context, right? And what you're going to do is you're going to find out that people will connect with those things. I mean, you've got grits. I mean, I, you know, corn, you know, you know, that would be something that I would use. Um, buttermilk, um, you know, could I do something, you know, that's there? Um, we often put honey onto buttermilk biscuits with butter. So can I play with those kinds of flavors in, in where the it's a honey flavored candy shell with something with, you know, a butterscotch inside of it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but make wow. the butterscotch with buttermilk. That's wonderful. <laughs> right? Yes. So oh, I wow. think, think, think about where you are and what it inspires you, the foods that you love and then figure out how to do it. No, so for example, one of the things that I did for a food, I was cooking for a food festival, Pig Island here in New York, so a pork and craft beer festival. And what I did was I made a milk chocolate salted buttered caramel. So I took a standard salted butter caramel recipe, but I added milk chocolate to it. And I thinned it down to the point where I could put it in a squeeze bottle. And then what I took is peaches and I put the peaches in uh, regular sugar, right, before I put them on a charcoal grill. So I had grilled peaches. Um, and then I put them on top of uh, a buttermilk biscuit, but it was a white chocolate chip, butterscotch chip, bacon bit butterscotch, uh, buttermilk biscuit. So can you sort of get what that might be like, white chocolate, butterscotch, bacon in a buttermilk biscuit? Yes. Right, yes, with, with a grilled peach on top of it, right, with this salted, this milk chocolate butter caramel sauce over the top of that, right. So it's mixing traditions in a lot of really, really interesting kind of ways. But you know, from where you are in North Carolina, you can go, yeah, bacon, buttermilk biscuits. Yeah, I get that, right. So my favorite biscuit is tomato, salt, molasses, and bacon. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, you know, you, molasses. So now what you do is you have a you have a sugar candy which is heavily molasses flavored. Right? So you can imagine that. And so find a way to do these other flavors in the filling that you put inside of it. Right? It it yeah, it's going to it's going to be really really interesting and you know, if you decide to experiment with any of these things, I raise my hand, send them to me, and I would be I would just love to 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 taste what it is that you're experimenting with. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I was going to tell you, come and work at the factory with me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's better. I'm going to send you the sample. Right. So, so I will, uh, I'm following you. You can follow me back. 
Um, after the session, what I will do is I will connect with you uh, on Instagram if you're there. But the other thing is that anybody can connect with me at clubhouse at thechocolatelife.com. So just clubhouse at thechocolatelife.com and um, we can connect offline that way. I do want to say it's 11 o'clock. We're here at the Daily Open Chocolate Chat on Clubhouse. My name is Clay Gordon, the creator and moderator of thechocolatelife.com, and I want to welcome everybody for joining us today um, and providing their input and feedback um, and encouragement. And Lynn, what have you got? Lynn Bishop, not Lynn Lockwood, because Lynn is in the room, but Lynn Bishop, what have you got this morning? Hi. Good morning, Clay and David. Thank you for this inspiring conversation as always. And good morning to all the regulars. It's nice to see you all back in the room this morning. So my girlfriends have uh, twisted my arm to do a wine and chocolate pairing on Sunday. I would love to hear any of your tips or ideas for that. I know it's not always a super successful pairing. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to just pick your brain about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, on this uh, topic of flavors from the region that you are located in, if anyone in the room has any ideas for uh, soursop, um, I've just done a soursop harvest. They're delicious. I'm really racking my my brain to think about how to incorporate them either in chocolate or in other recipes. So those are my two questions. Okay. Oh my goodness, in Honduras, soursop was my favorite. It's called guanabana there. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's my favorite fruit. <laughs> so Lynn, I, there are, let me tackle the soursop question first, if I can. Um, so uh, do you have the ability, do you have a dehydrator? Yes. Okay. So take the soursop pulp and dehydrate it into fruit leather. Great. Okay. And now cut it into small bits and use it as an inclusion in a chocolate bar. Cool. All right. So that's, that's just right off the top of my head. That's one of the simplest things that you can do. If you, have the, if you are making filled chocolates, so confections, obviously a soursop ganache is going to be the way to do it. You know, you can do it as a non-dairy ganache. Just use the soursop, and if you need any additional liquid, it can be water, um, or it could be Panamanian rum. I don't. I would have to think really hard about the Panamanian rum that might go with soursop, but think about it that way. Okay. Um, so, uh, are there any other things you can do? Can you make a soursop jelly and use the soursop jelly or jam as a filling in a bonbon? That's something I've considered. And so those are easy ones, David. Really high pectin content in cocoa shells, the pod shells that would that would set that sour sop. It would uh, give you a really good set. So you're talking about the husk has a lot of pectin, as opposed to the shell around the beans. No, no, the the the, the pod. The so pod. it's actually yeah. So so once you've taken the beans out, uh, you can crush the pod down, and as that starts to ferment, because it's like the mucilage, uh, it. it it's got lots and lots of pectin in, so it thickens mm -hmm. almost by the hour. So you need to be careful how much you put in, but that would give you a really good gelling agent, and you can make cocoa jam or cocoa gel jelly that way. David, can I DM you about that? No. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so Lynn, um, there are lots of uses for the pods once you've taken um, the beans out of them. One of the things that I saw them doing down in Mexico is they had women who were, um, they were very, very careful about sectioning the pods horizontally uh, into two hemispheres. And when they got done, what they would do is they would scrape out the pulp inside the pod so that they just had a very, very thin layer and the shell of the pod. And then they would freeze them and they would use those as bowls for ice cream. So that's an interesting use of the pod if you want to have a, a ceremonial decoration. And yeah, no, David is absolutely right. If you scrape the pulp out of the, out of the pod, then that pulp um, has a lot of uses. It's kind of like pumpkin in that respect. Although, as David said, this has a much higher amount of pectin. So you can use it as the base inside a gel. Um, a, some sort of jam or jelly that you can flavor with something else. And it, it will provide a sort of depth and breadth and sort of richness and a mouthfeel 
that is going to be different from a typical jam or jelly. So I think that's a, just a really, really interesting concept uh, to explain. You can also do fries with it. You can <laughs> yeah. treat yeah. it like a pumpkin and, yeah. and cut it out from the outer shell right. and then you can fry those in cocoa butter obviously right. why would you fry in anything else make a mash out of them i mean it's 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 yeah, it's really quite a uh, and if you dry it and grind it you can turn it into flour and use it in baking right so if you're going to do that the one thing that i would be very careful about is that pods are normally allowed to rot on in the field in the farm and if you're going to take them out of the farm, you need to find a way to replace the nutritional value associated with a decomposing pod. So you do need to fertilize if you're going to start taking your pods out of the farm and use them for other purposes. And also you've got to bear in mind that the pod is a home for the midges that are going to pollinate your next crop, your next mm -hmm. harvest. Right. right. And so one of the things you can do is you, if you've got a palm tree, what you can do is you can cut the – if you cut the palm tree down – what you can do is you can cut the palm into like one inch sections, right? So cross sections, and you can use those and those will provide a home for midges. This is research that was done in Costa Rica like 20 years or 30 years ago, David. Um, and it's a good way to encourage midge growth is if you do need to take palm trees down rather than burning them or something like that, you can use them as a home because they will collect water and the midges will um, lay larval eggs and hatch um, in those things. Just something to consider about in a regenerative agricultural sense, Lynn. Well, I'm actually researching that in terms of banana um, right. stalks. You could, um, you could use have... banana as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it, there, I, I forget the name of the book. Um, there is a book about cocoa in Costa Rica. Uh, it's in my library, but my library is in storage during COVID. And so I can't put my hands on it right away. But there has actually been formal research on the effect in midge populations of using cross sections of palms and banana um, to increase um, the amount of litter around the trees so that it encourages midge, midge populations. But on the first question, which is going to be where we're going to end today's um, open chocolate chat, is about how do you do a wine and chocolate pairing. Right? And I would say, make it up as you go. Right? So one of the- Good, that's what I'm gonna do. All right. So I do a lot of chocolate and wine pairings and I have done them for a, a chocolate store here in New York City that's also a coffee store and they have a cafe with a wine license. And so they will uh, get corporate tasting gigs and they have often hired me to do them. And I have learned that for me, I do not want to have the same chocolate and the same wine over and over again because it's boring for me. And if it's boring for me, it's hard to make it interesting for the people who are in the tasting. So I prefer to walk into a tasting never having tasted the chocolate and never having tasted the wine. And so what we'll do is we'll get, for example, we'll get a white wine, maybe a rosé, and then we'll get two reds. Right? And they're different kinds. So we might do a Rioja, and then we'll do a Merlot or a Rioja, and a Cab, although, right, or a Pinot. You want wines which are not really similar in terms of their structure, because we're really looking at pH and tannins more than anything else. So uh, rather than grape varietals, you just want something which is different in, in pH and different in tannins when you think about red wines. And so a, a lighter weight Pinot Noir and a heavier Rioja or um, Cabernet Sauvignon. Those are two good ways to think about it. And then I do a white chocolate, a milk chocolate, and two dark chocolates. Right? And I don't care what they are. And what I do is I use this comparative approach. So you know, have both, the white, both red wines in glasses at the same time. Stick your nose in one right? and say, you know, what are your general impressions of it? Wait, so you want to try to develop a, a, a flavor memory, a snapshot of what the aroma of that wine is. And then what you do is you put the other glass of wine on your nose and you try to develop a flavor snapshot, a memory snapshot of that. Right? And you're going to wait 30 seconds between those two things. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take the first wine, smell it, and then immediately take a deep breath of the other wine. And what you'll find is that with the aroma of the first wine in your nose, the aroma of the second no, second wine will be different from your initial memory of it. Right? 
then wait 30 seconds and do it in the other order, the second wine and the first wine. And you'll find that with the aroma of the first wine in your nose, or the, the second one, the, the aroma of the other one will taste, will, will smell very different. Right? So this is this notion of the order in which we ha have things will affect our perception of them, which goes back to this Joseph Albers homage to the square, si you know, simultaneous contrast basis for comparative tasting. You can do the same thing with tasting the wine. Put a small sip of one wine in your mouth, develop a flavor snapshot. If you need to, you can take a little bit of water, try to get that flavor out of your mouth. Then taste the second one, get a flavor snapshot, right? Then take, again, a, a sip of that second wine again, and then immediately put the second, the first wine in your mouth. And what you'll do is you'll go, oh my gosh, these are radically different, right? The, they've, they've just influenced each other, right? And then you can do the same thing with a chocolate. You smell a chocolate, you smell another chocolate, you taste them, you go, ooh, you know, you do the same thing and you understand how they work. And then you can do the same thing with the chocolate and the wine. You say, here's one chocolate, here's one wine, right? And it may turn out that the two cho the chocolate and wine do not go together, right? And so the way I think about it is, does the chocolate make the wine taste better? Does the wine make the chocolate taste better? Or does it make it worse in either of those things? Or is the combination of the two somehow lifted, right, by putting the two together? And what you want to do is you want to put the chocolate in your mouth. You want to get it completely melted, right? You want to make sure that there's no fat. It's completely liquid. And then you want to put in your mouth a volume of wine, which is sort of roughly equal in your brain to how much chocolate is in your mouth, and swirl the two together in your mouth so that you're mixing the flavor chemicals of the chocolate and the wine in your mouth, and you're breathing retronasally, and you've got all these things across your tongue. Okay. Does that process make sense? Absolutely. And it's really helpful. I, I love how you've deconstructed it. Right. So now what's really interesting is you can have two people who have just consumed exactly the same thing and they will have diametrically opposed reactions to it. Right? Some people will like it, some people will hate it. Right? Or everyone might like it, or everyone might hate it. And what you want to do, I, what I do, I, I'm not going to tell you what you should do, but <laughs> what I do is that is the point where you can start having an, a dialogue. Ooh, what is it about it that you don't like? Right? So you may find out that it might be cultural. You know, somebody comes from some place and, you know, they have a childhood memory, you know, in their mother's kitchen of not liking a particular thing. And this reminds them of something they grew up hating, right? And th I think that's a really, really, those are where the interesting conversations are. Or you might find somebody comes from a cuisine background, for example, Thai, as opposed to Indian. And so they just have different perspectives on things, Right. Um, somebody might be a more sophisticated taster than someone else is. And that's where the dialogue can begin, and that's where it's interesting. The most important thing to remember is that, again, every single one of us has our own sense of taste. Every single one of us has our own sense of smell. And what I taste and I smell is right for me. And if you taste and smell something different that's right for you, it doesn't mean I'm wrong. And it doesn't mean you're wrong. It's just we have perceived these things differently based upon our sensory apparatus, our innate ability, right, chemically, what's going on with my sensory system to be able to, to, to be able to, um, to be able to chemically sense things, and then my ability to identify them through memory. And the number one thing that's most important here in all of this is if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough, right? M most of the time, not most of the time, but a lot of the time for many of the people in the room, these pairings will not work, right? In the sense that people will say, I don't like them. These two things do not go together for me. And if you're not doing that, right, you're not pushing hard enough because it's in the, it doesn't work for me, is where you can start learning from that failure. If everything always works, I'm only doing pairings that I, here's a port wine, it's sweet. I'm going to put together this chocolate, right? So if it if you know it's going to work, right, then um, there's nothing you can learn from it, right? Other than mm, these two things taste good together. I like that. So embrace, embrace. You know, go to the store, pick four very different wines, 
go to the store or make four very different chocolates and then just play with the combinations to see if one of them goes, oh my gosh, I never thought these two things would go together, but they're so good, <laughs> right? David, you have that experience? That's great, Clay, thank you. Right. David, do you have that experience? Absolutely, I've just sent you some notes, Lynn. Uh, it's a booklet, that the separate, so you'll have to put it together as a PDF. Uh, but yes, I think it's really unhelpful for somebody to give you a list of specific vineyards that you can't find or you can't afford uh, with some very specific chocolates that you can't find or afford uh, most of the time. And you look and think, well, you've not taught me anything there. Uh, all you've done is tell me you had a great night. Uh, and really, we want an experience not right. to look at someone else having a great night. Right. And you've just rubbed my nose in it. Right. <laughs> right. So one of the thing, one of the great things about working in an environment, um, this is a store in New York City called Two Beans, Coffee and, and Cocoa, is that I only worked with wines that they served. And I only worked with chocolates that they sold. And so there was never, there was never the opportunity to create a combination that if somebody liked it, they couldn't go downstairs and buy it. Absolutely. And Clay, we'll both work. Uh, we work for money to pay our mortgages. So if, some, if somebody says, will you do me this thing? Absolutely. Of course oh, I will. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. We need to be pragmatic, pragmatic about it. But if I have the opportunity to be able to create the environment, um, this is how I am going to do it. And so, Lynn, I would be really interested is, um, you know, it just, even though I may not be able to buy the wine and I may not be able to buy the chocolate, I would be really interested in knowing what the wines and chocolates were and just a general sense for how things came and what people, the nice thing I like, the thing that I like most about the approach that I talked about to you is that it is interactive and collaborative. It's not like I am presenting to you right? My sense of taste and my sense of smell and what I think is good. We're engaged in this journey of helping each other explore and understand what taste is about. And I think that's the, you will be surprised. If I walk away from one of these tastings and there is a combination that surprises me, it's a good evening. I have learned something. And that's what I want out of my tasting. I want to learn as much from these tastings as the people who are there. And listening to people's conversations about what they like and what they don't like makes me evaluate what I think. And that's really, really important for me. And uh, I would really love to hear, you know, how it goes for you. I will. I'll definitely uh, follow back up. And And the cool thing actually is everybody's bringing the bottle of wine. So I'm not even, I have no idea what's going to show up. So I do know the chocolates, but I don't know the wine. Okay. And so you have the perfect environment for not obsessing about this because you have no control over the outcome. So give up the notion that you have any control and just go with it and have fun with it. And my experience is if you're having fun with it, everybody else will have fun with it. But if you're stressed about it, everybody else will be stressed about it. So yeah, no, it sounds like a whole lot of fun um, to do. And it's actually a great, if somebody, you know, if somebody is thinking about doing a chocolate and wine evening and you've got a whole bunch of people, have a bunch of people drink wine and then or bring wine and have a bunch of people bring chocolate and nobody communicates with anybody. All you want to do is you want to say about the wine, it's like you bring a red, you bring a white, you bring a rosé, you bring a sparkling and I don't, you don't care what it is, right? Or, if, you know, you bring a Pinot and you bring a Malbec and you bring a Cab. Right, you 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 want to make sure that you don't have four people bring four Argentinian Malbecs because it's going to be more difficult um, to do these things. And you know, I don't know what wines are available um, where you are in in Panama, uh, so it may be a little more difficult. And you know, throw in a ringer if there's some locally made wine, um, do that. In Belize, we have a bunch of ginger wine, and we have some cashew wine. They're awful, by the way. The cashew wine is just awful. Um, ginger wine's pretty good. Um, but yeah, no, go for it because you are locally made chocolate that you're making. If you've got something which is local, um, then I think that would be a really, really good thing as well. And another thing to consider is if you can, you may not have time to dehydrate the soursop pulp, but putting something fruity in one of the chocolates and thinking about that deliberately with how that might work or not work with a wine, because the soursop is going to have a fairly low pH and it was not going to work 
with a um, high pH wine um, very, very well. So something to consider there as, as you start thinking about things. Thanks. All right. So we're here for an hour, 20 minutes, uh, at the daily open chocolate chat here on Clubhouse. Again, my name is Ben Clay Gordon. I want to thank David Greenwood Haig from the UK for joining me, Zelia, Dina, and Lynn for your joining me and sharing your thoughts. Uh, you've helped make this day uh, and this room really, really uh, informative and interesting and special for me. I do want to remind everybody that you can go to thechocolatelife.com. I encourage people to sign up. There is a free membership tier. Um, there, of course, if you want to support what it is that I'm doing by becoming a paid member, uh, that is always an option. There is a story on the Chocolate Life pinned to the upper left-hand corner of the homepage, which shows everything that's going here on Clubhouse, as well as a link to a folder on a shared Google Drive. You can go there and find not only the detailed daily, uh, weekly schedules, but if there are resources which have been talked about, um, there are links to those resources as well as any documents that we've mentioned have been downloaded into the enclosing folder so that you can download them and you can use them as well. And I want to say thank you very much to everybody. On Monday, we are going to be back here on Monday. Um, we're going to be doing an origins, which is slightly different. We're going to be looking at the prehistory of cacao. Um, rather than looking at a particular country. Uh, also scheduled for next week, I'm not certain exactly what the days are, we're going to be looking at weird flavor combinations. We're going to be discussing, is chocolate dangerous? Uh, in part because of uh, my post about uh, today's, where I, you know, tasting, where I had a dog photo, but just generally, um, is chocolate dan dangerous? The, the idea of on, on beyond bean to bar. All right, a reference to Dr. Seuss on beyond zebra, and beyond being to bar, you know, if you're a chocolate maker um, if, and you're only making bars, what are the other things you might be doing? And then we'll also be taking a look at some of the big, biggest marketing blunders that specialty chocolate makers make. That's what's on tap for next week, 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, here on the Daily Open Chocolate Chat on Clubhouse.